Hello again, this is the AP Phys Pinterest High School AP Physics 1 video series. This is video 5D, uh, Conservation of Energy. <coughs> now the law of conservation of energy says that the total energy does not increase or decrease in any process. It's another way to say that uh, matter or energy cannot be created or destroyed. Uh, this is the premise that we're going to proceed from. Uh, we're going to restrict our analysis to uh, forms of mechanical energy that we're familiar with. Uh, that is kinetic energy, uh, elastic potential energy, and gravitational potential energy. When we look at a given situation, there will be two or more uh, points of interest in the problem. We could refer to these points as um, initial and final, or before and after or points A and B, or points 1 and 2, uh, whatever we call them is irrelevant. For the purposes of the lesson, we're going to stick with A and B and potentially C and D. Uh, the problem statement itself might indicate to you where the points of interest are, or you may have to require them. You may be required to establish them for yourself. Uh, that'll probably be later on. Now, problem solving strategy. Um, the first thing we're going to do is look at point A. And we're going to ask a number of questions about uh, the presence of different forms of mechanical energy. So first we're going to ask um, if the object is moving. Um, if it is moving, then we would say it has kinetic energy. We know that already. Uh, the how much, of course, is 1 half mv squared. We're going to differentiate this point by saying v sub a squared. So the kinetic energy at point a would be 1 half mv a squared. We're then going to ask if it's elevated. Um, we would have already established the um, h sub 0 or h naught, which would be the lowest point the object is likely to reach. Um, that would be our, our 0 or our vertical origin. Um, if the object is above that point, then we would say it has gravitational potential energy. We know that how much is mgh. We'll specify mgh sub a to indicate when and where we're talking about. Uh, the last one is um, if the object is on a spring or a rubber band or something that's stretched or compressed. If the answer is yes, then we would say it has elastic potential energy. We know that how much is 1 half kx squared. We'll specify 1 half kx sub a squared to indicate point a. Now collectively, these three expressions together represent the total energy in the system at point A. Uh, we're going to call it um, capital E sub A. That's the total mechanical energy in the system at point A. The energy at point A could be any combination of these three terms um, depending on what the answers to the questions are, yes or no. Uh, we could have one or two or all three or conceivably none of them. Now then we're going to look at point B, or the after, or the later, or the final, or whatever you want to call it, um, and ask the same three questions to determine the presence of mechanical energy. Now the questions are the same. Of course we're asking about point B instead of point A. So if it's moving at point B, then we would say it has kinetic energy at point B. Uh, we know that how much is 1 half mv squared. We would specify v sub b. Is the object elevated? Again, with reference to h naught. If it is, then it has gravitational potential. How much? mg h sub b. If it's on a spring that's stretched or compressed, then it has elastic potential. 1 half kx b squared. So again, these three collectively represent the energy of point b. We would call that E sub B. And again, we may or may not have one or two or three or none. Now, if we look at the similarities and the differences, the obviously the formula is used to determine how much of each is the same. Uh, what's different about it are the positions and the velocities. So represented by V sub A and V sub B, H sub A, H sub B, X sub A, X sub B. These are different places and potentially doing different things. 
Now the next thing we need to do is determine if there's a, an applied force between points A and B. Uh, if there is an applied force, we want to know if it does any work. And if so, how much? We know that how much is Fa times D times cosine of theta. Um, theta is the angle between the force and the displacement. And um, this will tell us if the <coughs> system has had any energy transferred into it. We're then going to be looking for uh, friction between points A and B. If it's on a surface and there's a mu, then there'll be a friction force, and that friction force will do negative work. Um, so it'll remove energy from the system. And how much it removes, of course, is negative mu FND. Now, the major thrust of this, uh, of this analysis is the energy conservation formula, which looks like this. Again, big blue box. It's not on your formula sheet, but this is one you want to remember. Energy at A in all its forms, plus and minus the work done, if there is any, equals the energy at B in all its forms. Now, again, this is, this is deceptively simple looking because the energy at A and energy at B terms could include any combination of those three terms we saw before. So if we look down here, this is about the worst case scenario. Here's point A. We have all three forms present. There's work done between A and B. There's negative work done between A and B. And then we have the energy at B in all three of those forms. So this is about as bad as it could get. It is unlikely that we would have all eight terms in, in one single problem, but it's possible. So now we'll take this idea and we will apply it to a few different types of problems, some things that we've already seen uh, that we will look at from a work and energy perspective. Uh, we have a ball that uh, has a mass m. It's thrown with some velocity um, v sub a at some elevation angle theta. Um, when we look at the trajectory here, we can see that we have three points of interest, a, b, and c. Um, point A is as it's released, B is at the highest point, and C is as it hits the ground. And we're told we can ignore air resistance. So we're going to look at this problem and immediately establish H0 is going to be the lowest point, the ground. The ball won't go any lower than that. And now we'll write the energy equation for points A and B. When we look at point A, it's as it's released. So we ask if it's moving. Yes, it is moving, so it has kinetic energy. That means I'll have a 1 half mva squared term. If it's elevated at point A, then it has gravitational potential energy. It's above the ground, some height here, height of the person's arm as they release the ball. So this is an mgha term. Uh, there's no spring or elastic energy. So this represents my energy at A. I have kinetic and gravitational potential at point A. When I look at point B, well, you might be tempted to think that it's not moving there, but what you remember about projectiles is that they do have constant velocity horizontally. So it will have some velocity at point B. Um, that means we have a 1 half mvb squared term. It's clearly elevated at point B above the ground, so the energy at B is 1 half mvb squared plus mghb. When we set up the energy equation, right, we have energy at A equals energy at B. The good news about projectiles is that once the ball leaves the thrower's hand, there's no applied force that's adding energy to the system. So there's no positive work done on the projectile. Uh, we're told that we can ignore air resistance, so there's no friction. Um, so then this is my final energy equation. If this problem had numerical values, we would need some information. We would need uh, the height of the release point and maybe the initial velocity and the angle. Um, once we write the energy equation, uh, typically there's one single variable missing that uh, we would have to solve for. Now what if we 
looked at this problem between points A and C, right? we still have the same total energy at point A, there's energy at A, the energy at C is represented by only kinetic energy. And we see that as it lands, it has now reached the H0, which means it's not elevated, so there's no gravitational potential at that point, which is why we have only kinetic. All right, so here's another one. It's a familiar situation. We have a crate, and it's got a mass, and uh, it's moving at some velocity at point A. Uh, frictionless surface. The horizontal applied force go, um, accelerates the crate through a displacement D. So it goes from point A to point B. Now you'll, again, you'll agree that it's moving at point A, so it's going to have a kinetic energy term. Uh, it's not elevated, and there's no spring or elastic. So at point A, we have 1 half MVA squared. That's the energy in the system. Uh, we, of course, have an applied force between A and B. It's going to do positive work. It's going to make the, um, it's going to add energy to the system. FA times D. Um, we'll get to the cosine theta in a moment, while we can ignore that. At point B, the object is still moving, or actually moving faster, so it's going to have a 1 half MVB squared term. It's not elevated, there's no elastic. Uh, surface is frictionless, so there's no negative work done. Um, we can ignore the cosine theta in this case because FA is horizontal and D is horizontal. So if they're both in the same direction, the angle between them would be zero. The cosine of zero is one, so we can ignore the cosine theta there. So here's my energy equation. There's my energy at A, there's my work done, there's my energy at B. All right. So that'll do it for the conservation of energy. We can apply this um, idea to lots of different situations that we've already seen. And um, we'll be doing that for the next couple of weeks. Uh, until next time, enjoy, and I'll see you again soon.